life itself, carbon dioxide, the very thing that you and I exhale every single time we take a breath, the ability to have some way of of monitoring, tracking, controlling, and trying to sequester and and uh, and and limit the amount of carbon dioxide is inherently, by its very nature, an attempt to control and limit and sequester and and otherwise uh, delimit the amount of life on the planet. And I think it's that control that we have to look at as the real driving, guiding ideology for the people who are the very core of this of, of the hoax that's being perpetrated here. Now, when you say control, like they, they want to control the people, and that was a, an incredible example that you gave about the uh, carbon dioxide um, and controlling you know, everyone in that respect, but how would they go about controlling the carbon dioxide? Well, it's, I mean, it sounds almost inconceivable, but the idea has been floated now by, uh, even by career politicians. There was a, a, a parliament, uh, parliamentarian in the UK who several years ago, I'll have to pull up the source, but uh, was actually proposing the idea of a carbon credit card to be assigned to every citizen that would delimit the amount of carbon uh, dioxide. Well, they, 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 it never even gets to that level. They just say carbon that can be emitted by a certain person. And that would take into account, presumably, all of the different activities that one engages in, including, of course, filling up your car at the gas pump. But amongst other things, the uh, if you buy, uh, if you bought food, for example, that, that had to be transported from a, a long distance away, then that obviously requires uh, carbon to to do that carbon dioxide so you would have to have a way to account for that in the system so i think at some level I, again it has been actually proposed in the uk it wasn't i believe taken very seriously at the time but it was proposed by uh, someone in the uk parliament it has been proposed also by uh, the scientific advisor to the pope who uh, uh, a few years ago was talking about this idea that Ultimately, the the end game would be to have every single person on on the planet assigned a certain allowable amount of emissions that they could produce or that they could be responsible for. And presumably, if you reach your limit for the month or for the year or what have you, then well, you're just going to have to sit there and starve to death if uh, if that's what it means, because you won't be allotted any more of this uh, life giving gas uh, CO two. So. I mean, this is this is what we're looking at ultimately, and that that idea of that level of control over everyone's life has been technically impossible until the current time period, where we actually now start to have the technologies to monitor and control what people are doing with uh, with their. I mean, even in their own homes, we now have the smart grid, where we have electricity that is uh, that is monitored, uh, and and again can be controlled from from decentralized outward places at all times and can be of course uh, hooked on hooked, hooked into the internet so they can be monitored from remote locations at, at all times so the technological infrastructure for such an idea is going into place right now and we now have the guiding ideology as it was this climate change idea for why we would need to monitor everything that everyone is doing and uh, basically to allow them to do it or to decide oh no you've reached your allowance for this month you have to stop your your activity um and and it sounds like a nightmare scenario and it is and if it was ever introduced to the public in that way it would be laughed off the face of the planet but because it is cloaked in this this cloak of green and it's given this this green environmental uh, gloss people will apparently swallow it hook, line, and sinker and march right in line with the carbon footstep footprint idea uh, right into their own early graves. So, I mean, I'm hearing what you're saying, but, I mean, before they even get to that point, I, I don't know if people today would say, okay, you know, here's my allotment. This is this is what I, I have to use for the entire, you know, day, the week, the month, or whatever. Um, I think they would probably most likely ease us into this where maybe they'll just have a flat rate tax or something and then slowly bring us into this controlled because when I look at what they always do is it's not boom right out there full force. It slowly methodically creeps into your life and we I think Australia, they, didn't they have a carbon tax but that was repealed? Um, where they were actually charging 
uh, or taxing people. Um, yes, and there carbon. still exists. There are carbon taxes in various places around the world. Uh, British Columbia, in my home and native land of Canada, has a, a carbon tax at the moment. Uh, I can't remember the exact numbers that it's at per ton uh, of carbon dioxide, but it, it was introduced at a certain level, and it's, I think, tripled since it was introduced. And then now it's being hailed as a, a wonderful uh, you know, a, a example of what can be made possible with this. And I think you're absolutely right that this is the way that this is done. Of course, it will be, of course, it will be uh, uh, introduced uh, gradually and only in small increments. Oh, this is only going to be a, a tiny little tax that's only when we're talking about however many, you know, thousands of tons of, of CO2. It's only really to apply at the industrial level, but it will come down to the in individual level eventually. And I did pull up that uh, story from 2008 about the uh, MP in Britain uh, that, was, that was proposing this. Uh, every adult in Britain should be forced to carry carbon ration cards, say MPs. And it, it goes on to say that the Influential Environmental Audit Committee says a personal carbon trading scheme is the best and fairest way of cutting Britain's CO2 emissions without penalizing the poor. Under the scheme, everyone would be given an annual carbon allowance to use when buying oil, gas, electricity, and flights. Anyone who exceeds their entitlement would have to buy top-up credits from individuals who haven't used up their allowance. The amount paid would be driven by market forces and the deal done through a specialist company. So again, there's a confluence of, of uh, agendas that, that work into this, one of which, of course, is that there's an entire financial bureaucracy and, and financial middleman who gets a, a cut of these, these types of deals and transactions that goes on, which, of course, is going to be the same large banks that that profit from every type of bu bubble, including this uh, coming carbon bubble. But again, uh, underlying that is the question of, well, who is creating these allotments, these limits for people? And what happens if you don't have the money to pay for that? I guess, uh, how does that not penalize the poor, as they, as they say in, in the, this puff piece, when that is exactly what will happen? The poorest will not be able to use uh, any more than their allotment, and the rich will be able to buy, of course, as much as they need, which is perfectly in line with all of the, the green hypocrites who go around the world on their private jets trying to teach everyone, oh, you shouldn't be using so much carbon dioxide, whereas, you know, they're, they're flying around in their private jets with their, their entourages uh, enjoying their, you know, $1,000 plate meals. Um, it is, of course, I mean, again, on its face, it is ridiculous, but uh, this is how it's done. And I think this type of idea, which apparently was spearheaded by uh, this uh, member of parliament in Britain, uh, Tim Yeo, uh, is the type of idea that is really, I think, meant to push that, that Overton window of what is acceptable, what is feasible, what is thinkable. And of course, most people, I think, most people with their heads screwed on straight would find that carbon ration card idea to be horrendous. Mm -hmm. But they would go with, oh, well, we just need a little tax. We'll just take a little tax. And then, uh, well, a little bit bigger tax because the little tax isn't working. And eventually you push it towards the, the idea of that individual carbon ration. You know, it's funny. We're talking about this and we're talking about, you know, rationing carbon. And the, I don't know if you ever saw this movie called In Time where everyone got a certain amount of time. And this was the time that you had. And you had to work for more time. If your time ran out, you passed away. And the wealthy had, you know, tons of time, but the poor had to keep on working. They get their, you know, another 20 hours to live, another 20. It's a very interesting movie, and it, it reminds me so much of what you're saying about carbon that the parallels are incredible of how they can completely control the population by controlling their bodies, their breath, you know, everything about them. And... This scares me. I mean, it, well, as it should, because uh, again, this isn't being plucked out of thin air. There's actually quite a large um, intellectual pedigree to this that can be traced back at least as far as a movement back in the 1930s that was fairly large in the United States um, and elsewhere called the technocracy movement. Um, it was it was born from the the, the the works on scientific management by people like Edward Bellamy and uh, Frederick Soddy, but it was really developed in the 1930s into a well an actual formal organization called Technocracy Inc. But their idea was to create a system that would uh, use as a currency 
energy. Energy is, of course, the, the unit which is required for all productive economic activity. So why don't we use energy as a currency? And people can be allotted a certain amount of energy as their, their sort of ration, and you can't go over that. So you, you can do anything you want within that realm, within that amount of energy that you've been allotted. And that was, I mean, that was an idea that was, uh, that was worked out. It was uh, quite popular, as I say, in the, the early part of the 20th century, and uh, did sort of go away. It's still, still around in one form or another, but it's, I think it's really just been subsumed into this climate change idea. And I think they're taking that technocratic idea of trying to allot everyone an energy allotment and just, well, okay, we'll just make carbon, carbon dioxide the, the energy allotment. And, and I mean, this, this, the stupidest part about all of this from, from the, the perspective of the, the climate change debate is that when you look at climate change, I mean, there would be some sort of case to be made if we were talking about methane or some of the, uh, the more uh, potent, as it were, the more potent greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is a relatively impotent uh, carbon uh, greenhouse gas, which is already mostly saturated. Uh, it's not the fact that you just keep adding carbon dioxide and it increases as exponentially the amount of warming that's supposed to take place. It, in fact, it's quite it's the opposite. The more you put in, the more there's a saturation of the, that, that, uh, that wavelength of light that it's, it's supposedly trapping in that's causing this greenhouse effect in the first place. So it doesn't work in that, clay, in that case. And the more that you add, ultimately, the less effect it has. So, and carbon dioxide is already almost saturated. So really, I mean, the, the idea of trying to pin the blame of, carbon, of, of the climate change on carbon dioxide is itself quite laughable and in the case of trying to say that the uh, the tail is wagging the dog but uh, but it again it has to be that way for the technocratic idea to to take over that we we are going to base in our entire society and our, our currency and uh, these these rations on the amount of energy that people expend and of course carbon dioxide is the key uh, to the key to the the, the is the, it's the tailpipe of the global economy basically and if you can stop up the tailpipe and stop it from emitting, well, then you can shut down the economy in, in uh, a fashion that you choose at a time that you choose mm -hmm. for people that you choose, um, just depending on what carbon allowances you, you choose to allot them. James, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. I really appreciate it. And once again, how can people get in touch with you? I am at CorbettReport.com, that's C-O-R-B-E-T-T, Report.com. You will find thousands of hours of free audio and video and uh, articles to download and read there. I hope you'll do so. It's, uh, it's a resource. It's meant to be one. There's also a contact form there if you want to get in touch with me directly. Well, James, thank you very much.